Well, in the 1920s, America had a drinking problem. Uh, Daniel O. Cringe wrote a book about it called Last Call, The Rise and Fall of Prohibition. And he started the book by saying, America has been awash in drink from its start. For context, in 1830, American adults per capita drank seven gallons of pure alcohol per year. If you're trying to get your head around that, that's three times what we drink today, right? Uh, in, uh, in 18... 50 Americans consumed 36 million gallons of beer. By 1890, it had gone up to 855 million gallons of beer. Abraham Lincoln said of alcohol, it commonly enters into the first draught of an infant and the last thoughts of a dying man. He called it the devastator. Benjamin Franklin recorded uh, 228 synonyms for drunk. That's how drunk America was. Right? Uh, women's suffrage launched in many ways because of women saw the devastation that this was bringing into their homes and into their families. And they said, we need to see the cultural tide change, right? And so in the 1920s, we as a country, we made a decision to enact prohibition, to prohibit the sale and distribution of alcohol, external laws to shut down this behavior that was destructive to our society. And many of you know, we widely consider it to not have been particularly successful. In some ways it was. America did drink less. But as you look through history, in many ways, we just got sneakier about how we drank. And it sort of emboldened organized crime. So as a nation, we thought, you know what? We've got a problem, but external laws meant to cage it in isn't really solving it. So a decade later, 1930s, uh, there was a guy, Bob, who's a recovering alcoholic, was going on a work trip to Ohio and realized, I am tempted to drink. He called his mentor, hey, I need some help. And he said, hey, there's another guy that's an alcoholic in Ohio named Bill. So Bob called Bill and the two of them started to hang out and they realized, you know what? In this context of understanding and grace and kindness with each other, we find strength and we find some hope. And they began to encourage each other. And, and as they did it, they talked about the reality that among other things, addiction is a spiritual issue. Uh, that, that there's something broken in us, that uh, many people say that addiction is an intimacy disorder, that what we're meant to find in intimacy with God and intimacy with people, we can't find, so we go to a substance uh, to fill a void or to numb intolerable feelings. That's how some define addiction, right? It's a, it's a pathological relationship with a mood-altering experience. I don't like these feelings. They're intolerable. Let me blast them away with something, some distraction, uh, some beverage, some drug, some screen, some one's body, whatever I can use to get me out of having to deal with these intolerable elements of my life. And so what Bob and Bill started to realize was, you know what, where this begins? They said, we got to start with the reality that we have a problem and we are powerless to stop it. And not only are we powerless, it's completely unmanageable. The thing we went to as a solution has actually become our problem. It's destroying our lives. And so we admit a powerlessness and an unmanageability. And then what do you do when you go, okay, I'm powerless to this big problem in my life. You start looking, where's the power to fix it? I need to find a power bigger than me and I need to find a power bigger than my problem. That it not just has more power than I do, but has more power than even my problems do. And so they started to look to a higher power, that's what they called it, right? And I got to go to a higher power, and I got to admit my need, and I got to come empty, and I got to say, you save me, you help me, you give me grace, and I surrender to God. And as I do that, I find his grace helps me not have to try to bury the shame and then what's interesting is, as they continued to write out this list of what you need to do to get free, it ended up being 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Rather than external laws, it started from the inside out. I need a new relationship with God. I need him to heal what's broken in me so I'm not numbing it. And then as I stop the numbing, all the pain comes up, but it's in a context of understanding and grace where I can be healed. And as they wrote out these 12 steps, people started to get on board, and now millions of people, millions upon millions around the world have been let out of addiction because of the steps these men have made. Now, I mention all that because it, it was fascinating. A couple of years ago, I was listening to an interview with Michael Keaton. 
I don't know if many of you young people know who Michael Keaton is. He was Batman in the 80s, all right? In many ways, started this new superhero revolution, Batman, Michael Keaton. And he was talking with the interviewer about him getting sober. And uh, he was talking about these 12 steps, how magical they were in his life. And the interviewer was a recovering addict as well. And so they began to talk to each other and they were like, how do you think they wrote it? They're like, where did Bill and Bob get these these insights, they're, they're amazing. They're so intuitive about the human experience. They're so helpful in, in us liberating from the problems we couldn't liberate ourselves from. They were like, it's almost nigh into scripture, some holy book. They're like, where did they get it from? And the whole time I'm listening to this, I'm like, they got it from scripture. <laughs> that Bob was part of the Oxford group, which was a deeply Christian group. And, and yeah, he adapted the language for people who had a hang up about religion. Maybe they had had a, a bad church experience and so they were so hung up by the language. He changed the language to, to open the doors wider to others. But the reality is these principles are deeply rooted in the word. Why? Because this is a path to freedom. And what's fascinating is if you follow along the 12 steps, they sound a lot like the Sermon on the Mount. Where did we start last week? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Where does the blessing of God start? not by trying to get our act together, not by trying to control what's unmanageable in our lives, but by admitting our spiritual poverty. I am powerless, and what I'm doing is now unmanageable. And we mourn it. And then we start to hunger and thirst for righteousness. I need one who's bigger than me. And he says, when you're poor in spirit, yours is the kingdom. When you mourn, you'll be comforted. Right? When you hunger and thirst for righteousness, I'll fill it. And we begin to take our problems, not to a substance, not to a drink, not to a distraction, not to someone's bodies. We take it to God. And as we do it, we stop the numbing. And as the hurt comes up, it's in a context of grace. And then what's fascinating is in the 12 steps, the next thing you do is in that context of grace, now I'm not trying to bury my shame. And so since I'm not trying to bury my shame, I let the failures come up. And as I do it, I go, okay, God, I have your grace. Help me be what I'm supposed to be a responsible moral agent in the world. Help me now step out and be not a, a, a drain to the world, but a fountain to the world. And so you make a searching and fearless moral inventory, and then you go and make amends. Where I've put hurt in the world, let me make it right. It's the 12 steps. Fascinating, exactly what Jesus does in the sermon. If last week was the admission of need and the acceptance of grace, now Jesus turns and says, okay, now, in the context of my grace, let's deal with how to be a responsible moral agent in the world. And he starts with, let's deal with the anger. Let's deal with the hurt. Let's deal with the resentment buried inside. Now, before we get into his text, let me just say this. As we get into this, some of you go, well, Ben, why are we talking about this? This isn't an AA group. We're not addicts here. We don't have an addiction problem. Is that right? It's fascinating. Uh, Jeffrey D. Sachs of Columbia University releases the annual World Happiness Report. Uh, they report on happiness now. And the reason they do it is because they found a trend in America over several decades. And that is, as GDP rose and as people's personal income rose, happiness stayed flat. Success wasn't making us happier. And then an even more disturbing trend lately is happiness has begun to go down in America. That we are the most prosperous nation living at a relatively safest time in human history to be alive, and yet we are increasingly unhappy as Americans. And he was trying to understand why in his 2019 report, and so he entitled it Addiction and the Unhappiness of America. And he says, the rise of U.S. income has been accompanied by worsening health conditions and declining social trust. And he says, what's the causation? He's trying to figure it out, but he says, America is a mass addiction society. Gambling, social media, video games, unhealthy foods, alcohol, opiates, various substances, risky sexual behavior, the prevalence of addiction in U.S. society seems to be on the rise, and it's causing considerably, considerable unhappiness and depression. We've got a problem, America, and now we just have more substances to choose from than they did in the 20s. And so we've got a problem, right? And buried underneath all this is some simmering resentment. We've got an anger problem, too. Some of you go, Ben, do we really... I mean, I pulled up so many uh, illustrations of anger in America, but I realized, do you really need them? I mean, does anyone need to know that we're all upset? I mean, you look at the news and you see it. 
I'll give you one just because it's fascinating and maybe not what you expect because you're expecting me to go political. Uh, Nathan DeWalt is a psychologist at the University of Kentucky, and he studied song lyrics from the 80s to the 2000s. And he found that from 1980s to the 2000s, there's been a marked shift in song lyrics from words like we and us to I and me and words like love and care to words that are anger and want to hurt you. And so there's been a rise of narcissism in music and a trend towards hostility. Right? Uh, Gene Twenge told the New York Times, the recent songs are now about what the individual wants and how she or he has been disappointed and wronged. I did an experiment and looked up the top songs being listened to in Washington, D.C., and I would say about eight out of the top ten were about being upset. Right? It used to just be the purview of heavy metal, right? I dub the unforgiven, you know, and you're like, yeah, I do dub the, uh, you know, and then it moved into pop and now whole careers. Taylor Swift, Olivia Rodrigo now is just making bank off the fact that you're mad, right? <laughs> and they just put it to a tune for you. So we got an anger problem and we got to deal with it. So in the Sermon on the Mount, he starts with the Beatitudes. You're blessed, you're blessed, you're blessed when you admit your need. God comes in to meet it. God is gracious. This isn't external laws to cage you in and try to force compliance. That's not what Jesus is doing. He starts with your admission of need and the grace of God coming in. That's where it begins. But when it starts there, now the shift moves. And he says, okay, are you ready? In this context of acceptance and grace, let's take your rightful place as a responsible moral agent. You're putting something out in the world and it needs to change. And so he starts to talk about the anger. You've heard it said, to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. Now, he quotes there the Old Testament. He quotes the Ten Commandments. You've heard it said, you shall not murder. And, and let me just say, he's not undermining the Old Testament. Right? He's not trying to dismiss the Old Testament. What he's doing is, in one sense, intensifying it, and intensifying it by showing the direction that it points. There, there was a popular uh, method of interpretation back then, which was just to try to minimize it to the very minimum. So there was a law against do not murder. And the religious leaders were like, all right, I haven't committed homicide, done. And Jesus is like, that was never just the goal. Like, hey, I didn't commit homicide. I'm crushing this. What's next? He's like, no, that's not acceptable alone in society. Yes, we should not murder, but that isn't the hallmark we want of our community. It's meant to be more than that. And so he shows where the law points. It's a deepening, not destroying of the commands of the law because it's in human nature to want to do the minimum, right? How few hours do I have to work out to get in shape? How many days do I have to eat healthy? How many cheat days? Is three cheat days good, right? How much do I have to study to pass the test? We look for the minimum, right? And yet here Jesus says, we're not doing that with the word of God. How much do I got to do to be holy? How much service do I have to do for y'all to think I'm a good person? He's like, that's not the community I'm building. He said, I want us to chase being all that we're meant to be as men and women under God. We're not asking the minimum. We're asking what's possible when a human life surrenders to God. So yeah, it starts with not murdering each other, but then Jesus moves backwards upstream to the fountain and says, you know where murder comes from? It comes from anger. It comes from hate. And we need to address that. And so he says, yes, to your forefathers, the law was given to not murder. But I say, Whoever is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of judgment. What's interesting is he centers himself. I say this. It was, it was what blew their minds that Jesus was putting himself at the center like he wrote this. Hey, when I wrote the law, this is what it means because that's who he is, right? No one talked like that back then. Jesus was like, no, I'm telling you this is where the law is going. And I'm telling you, I don't want you to be angry and insult and be mean to each other. Now, is he saying it's wrong to always be angry or, or ever to be angry? No, because Jesus did get angry at times. Anger is the appropriate response to injustice and exploitation. We want a God of wrath when we consider abuse in the world. And so anger is the proper response to the abuse of others. And you'll see Jesus get angry at times, but his anger is holy, righteous, because it's rooted in love. 
It's an anger of love. I love people, so I don't like how you're treating them. Usually for us, our hate or our anger is because of our bruised ego. What you see here is he's moving on a progression from anger to calling to insulting someone and calling them a fool. It's anger that moves into name calling. Now, technically, can you call someone a fool? Yes. In the Old Testament, fool was a technical term for somebody who tries to divorce action from consequence. I can do this, but nothing bad will happen. That's called a fool, right? Um, The Bible has a technical term for it, and Jesus will use that term to address other people, right? You are a fool. And yet, he doesn't say it to dismiss them. The same Pharisees he calls fools, he prays that God would forgive them while they were crucifying him. So don't miss that. This is an attitude that leads to action. He's talking about a progression here of I get some resentment, you hurt my feelings, I get some anger. And rather than processing it and leading it to a place where I'm praying for you and hoping the best for you, I begin to insult you. That's a, he used an Aramaic word there, raka. It means empty head, blockhead. And then he moves on to whoever says, you fool. Uh, that's a Greek word. So he's, he's saying, hey, you can insult people in multiple languages. All of you are guilty, right? That's the point there. To insult one, if, if there's any nuance between those words, uh, that one is more about the heart. There's a moral indignation. You're a bad person. So you're stupid and you're bad. So if I don't like what someone says and I take the step of going, so I dismiss them, you are stupid and you are bad. That progression, Jesus says, whoa, that's dangerous. There's a simple word to summarize this. It's the word contempt. If I have contempt for someone, Jesus says, that's a problem. Contempt will lead to condemnation. It'll lead you to cancel somebody. What are we saying when we're saying that? I want you to go away. I don't want you to be in my view. I don't want you to exist. I want you gone. I want you dead. I just don't want to go through the inconvenience of killing you, right? But it's the same stream. It's the same ugliness. And Jesus takes us upstream to the source, right? And Arthur Brooks told the New York Times in March 2019, uh, we are a culture of contempt. That's what he wrote, uh, the title of his article. The tagline was, the problem in America is not incivility or intolerance, it's something far worse. He says, political scientists have found that our nation is more polarized than it's ever been since the Civil War. One in six Americans stopped talking to a family member or close friend because of the 2016 election. And then he cites an article in 2014 from a science journal about motive attribution asymmetry, which is a beautiful way of describing I assume my ideology is based in love, and I assume yours is based in hate. And he says, research has found that the average Republican and average Democrat suffers from a level of motive attribution asymmetry that's comparable with the Palestinians and Israelis. He says, people often say that our problem in America today is incivility or intolerance. That's incorrect. Motivation, attribution, asymmetry leads to something far worse, contempt which is a noxious brew of anger and disgust. It's not just contempt for the other person's ideas, but also for the other person. It's the unsullied conviction of the worthlessness of the other, spurred on by what he calls the outrage industrial complex of screaming politicians, news networks, columns, social media, contempt makes political compromise and progress impossible. It also makes us anxious, increases anxiety, depression, and sadness. It releases two stress hormones, cortisol and adrenaline, in ways both public and personal contempt is causing us deep harm. So Jesus goes upstream and says, what's upstream of killing is contempt. And we have a contempt problem in America. And let me just tell you, if God doesn't like it, I don't know if you picked up on that. He said, if you decide to harbor bitterness, which I love that verb, harbor, because a harbor is is where a boat pulls up to tie off and go in to the convenience store or restaurant, get a snack, sit down and eat, take a shower. If you pull your boat into a harbor, it takes refuge there and stays. If you harbor bitterness, that means you're letting bitterness kind of saddle up into your heart, throw out a rope, you tie it up, You let it into the restaurant with your other feelings. You let resentment kind of speak to them. You let them color the ambiance of the whole room. Are you harboring resentment? If we do that, it's a toxin in the culture. 
it's spreading a poison among us, right? And Jesus doesn't like it. And he says, so you'll be liable to the council. And, and back then, if you murdered somebody, you were brought before a council and a judge. It's that kind of system here. He's not saying you're going to go through a human court because a human court really has a hard time determining whether or not you're angry at someone. He's talking about defying divine judgment. And that's why he moves to the end to the hell of fire, which is our least favorite subject to talk about, right? Uh, but let's get technical. He calls it the Gehenna of fire. Gehenna uh, is a words, combination of words, uh, Gar Henon, the Valley of Hinnon. It was the south side of Jerusalem. In the Old Testament, there were kings uh, like Ahaz and Manasseh. When they blew off God, what's left? Me. If I'm not going to worship God, I worship me, and I need to consolidate my political power. And so they would worship gods that would consolidate their power. One of those powerful gods was Molech, and the way you worshiped Molech was by sacrificing your children. Convenient if you're a king wanting to eliminate rivals, and really shows everyone you're fearsome if you're willing to eliminate your own child. So in the Valley of Hinnon, leaders of the nation of the people of God would worship Molech by sacrificing their children in the Valley of Hinnon. And God said through the prophet Jeremiah, I hate that, and that has never even entered my mind. Why was God angry? Because of the disregard of human life. And so when Josiah's heart was captured by God, it says in the Old Testament, he defiled the Valley of Hinnon. He threw trash in it to defile it as a holy place. And in Jesus' day, it was still that. It was a noxious, smoldering, burning trash heap. And so in the Bible, it became a symbol of judgment, it became a symbol of eternal judgment. And so Jesus says, it's like that. The, the contempt we show people is so toxic and dangerous, I defile it. I cast it out. It's not welcome in my community. Among the brothers, that's the language he used here, the family of God, Jesus is knit together. We don't harbor bitterness because it leads to a devaluing of the image of God and people. We don't do that. It's interesting. The book of Genesis says we're in the image of God. And people debate, what does that actually mean? But there's only two other places in the Bible that bring it up. One of them says, you're in the image of God, so I don't murder you. And then one of them says, you're in the image of God, so I don't speak cruel things to you. Isn't that interesting? Because God made you and because you have value, I don't physically hurt you and I don't verbally hurt you, right? Both of those, why? Because you're made in the image of God. So God, some of you might be reading this, and you're like, man, this is my least favorite Jesus. I like the Jesus that's healing people. I like the Jesus that when someone's having a bad day, he's like, look at you, get up. You want some bread? Hey, bread for everybody. You get bread, you get fish. Like, I like that Jesus. This Jesus, man, this, oh, I hate when he starts talking like this too much. Well, let me just tell you, the reason he's talking with this kind of judgment is because of love, because he loves us because he doesn't want a community that harbors bitterness because he knows where that leads. It's the anger that leads to murder, and it's doing it. In Washington, D.C., our homicide rate hit a 16-year high in 2019. In 2020, it was 20% higher than 2019. In 2021, it's 20% higher than 2020. We're in a bad trend as a city, and there's a lot underneath that. I know there's a lot of issues I'm not getting to, right? And yet the reality is, can any of us debate as we as a community and a society stir in resentment and begin to ambiently radiate it out online, it's starting to move into property damage and shouting and yelling and the words always move to hands and the hands move to take life. And so Jesus backs it up and says, in my community, we cut it off here. We're cutting the hate out. That's who we are. So what do we do? He gives us the solution in 23 through 26. He says, so if you're offering a gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court. Lest your accuser hands you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will not get out until you've had the last Penny, he, he tells two stories, one about going to church and one about going to court. And he says, if you come to church and you're here and you realize, man, I got an issue with a brother, he says, you go make it right, right? You go solve that. It's fascinating. You would think he would put worship of God before being cool with other people, but God so values other people. He says, I don't want you to 
curse someone or shout them out and dismiss them and then worship me. He's like, "Mm -mm, go make that right and then we'll talk. That he so values other people, part of worshiping me is valuing other human beings. It's, it's indistinguishable. He says, so if you've got a problem, you go and dealt that person. And then he says on your way to court, hey, you've got a, uh, if you've got an accuser taking you to court, make it right as fast as you can. Because if you wait till you get to court, it only gets worse from there. If I was to summarize those two illustrations about what he's saying to do with anger, he says, get on it early because it costs too much to wait. That's the point. When you see a little seed of resentment inside of you, someone hurts your feelings, get on it early because it costs too much to do it late. And let me give you some free advice. This is critical in marriage. Let me tell you how this goes. You first get married, it's bliss. Before God and everybody, you're crying up front and then you run off to your honeymoon, it's magic. And then you get back home and you're getting ready and he's finished eating dinner. So he takes the dishes and throws it in the sinks and walks off and you're like, huh, am I supposed to do that? And you go, you know what? It's no big deal. It's fine. So you just wash it. It's fine. I don't care. Yeah, this isn't disrespect, whatever. Or you come home and you're tired and you sit on the couch and you want to watch TV and she's asking, how's your day and what happened? And you're like, why does she keep bothering me? You know what? It's fine. And rather than process, hey, when you say this, this is how I feel, you go, it's fine. And you just take a little bit of resentment and you just drop a little sand of resentment into the stream of your love. (laughs) And maybe it's just two, three sands of judgment first month, three, four, five, six, 20, 30. But you stack it up by a year and a year and a year, you always do that. You always disrespect me. You always talk like that. And then what happens? Year five, maybe you start going to counseling. Let me tell you what happens when you go to counseling. They start talking to you, and what happens? The more they get you to open up, you start going back to year one. Well, you know where it all started? And now you're having to pay money for you to talk about this now silt bed, beachfront of resentment sand that you've built up that has completely squeezed out all the love and passion in your marriage. And you're having to pay this guy to help you dig up what you could have dealt with early. And if you don't do it then, then you bring the lawyers in. And now it's talking money and you don't get out until you pay the last penny, that's what Jesus says. So get on it early because it costs too much to get on it later. And Donna and I talk about this all the time. We said, we're going to keep short accounts. We're going to keep short accounts, keep the circle small. It's not hurt feelings, resentment, hold on to it. 10 years later, bring it up, right? We're like, nope, hurt feelings, resentment, bring it up, right? And we tried to keep the circle small just to get, get, the, get the, the river clear and the water flowing, right? And so our first year of marriage, that meant a lot of long talks, four-hour talks that always started like this, me going, I don't want to do this. I don't have to do this. I could do something else. I don't have to do this. Spending like an hour, two hours saying things like this. And then finally walking in and going, uh, I need to talk to you. Um, when you said that earlier, what did you mean? Because uh, I thought when you made that joke about me and my head size that uh, it, um, it hurt my feelings. And I hate those words. I mean, it's hard to say. Like, it hurt my feelings. But I don't like that. You know, and she was just like, what? And that's not what I meant at all. It's not what you meant. No, it's not what I meant. Oh, what did you mean? Oh, I was trying to have fun. Oh, I like fun too. Oh, I like you. Oh, look at us. And the river's flowing. And you just (laughs) get the resentment out early. And conversations that took four hours at the beginning of our marriage take five minutes if they happen at all now. And let me tell you, we're the happiest we've ever been. Why? Because you get on it early because it costs too much to pay later, right? This is critical. It's critical in relationships. And so many of you know it. You've seen that. You let little irritations build up and slowly you went from not calling anymore to not texting anymore to never seeing again. And that's not how we're meant to work. We're meant to go a different way. And so if there's something wrong with somebody, make it right. Let me tell you something. This is very practical. I do this all the time. And it's because you have to when you preach a sermon. You realize when you preach a sermon, if, if the Spirit of God is not helping make these words make sense and opening up your heart to understand them, nothing of spiritual significance will happen. And if nothing of spiritual significance happens, then what am I doing up here? I'm just dancing. And I don't want to do that. And I want this to have spiritual power. But I know if I was rude to somebody, 
If I was impatient with them and harsh, if I do what most of us do, oh, I'm sure they're fine. It was no big deal. I was just tired. And dismiss, God's like, all right. And the faucet of the blessing of God turns off. I can feel it. And so I've realized I can't get out here unless I feel like me and God are good. And me and God can't be good if I've been harsh and impatient with my kids or Donna or any of you. And some of you, you can fake it. You're like, I can sit in church and all I have to do is just numb my emotions a little bit, kill what's inside. And God's like, no, I don't want you to do that. When you show up here, if you've hurt somebody, text them now. That's the great thing. You don't even have to leave your gift at the altar and go. You can just be like, oops, whoop. Hey man, can we talk later when I said this? And then don't minimize it. I was really tired. It'd been a long night. And you know how you get, that's not an apology. You say, hey, I was rude to you this morning. I'm sorry. Full stop. Remember, this started by talking about being a city on the hill, being a bright, shining light in a dark world. Can you imagine how different you will be in your culture if you say those words, I'm sorry? And mean them, not the dismissive way we do it now. Well, I'm sorry you feel that way. That's not an apology. You're apologizing for my feelings. That's completely illegitimate. You can't do that. Can you really say, I'm sorry for what I did? Because here's the fascinating thing as we land this thing. I want you to notice what Jesus is doing in this. Number one, he says, see it as personal. And I love that. He says, hey, it's not just about murder. It's about don't hate. And I think everyone would be on board with that message. That's so popular in America. Like, yeah, hate's dumb. I hate people who hate. And Jesus is like, right. And then he switches to personal pronouns. So if you are on your way to the altar and you remember that you hurt somebody else. And isn't that fascinating? He flips it on us. He doesn't say, so think about all the times you've been hurt. He doesn't do that. That's easy. That's a layup. Anyone can do that. Everyone does that. Let me catalog my resentments today, right? All of us know how to catalog where others hurt us. Jesus flips it and says, no, once you're right with me, I want you to take a searching and fearless moral inventory of your life and see where did you hurt somebody else? If there's a brother you offended, stop for a minute and think, was I cruel the way I talked to her? She was clearly trying to tell a story and did I blow her off? Was I impatient with him? Did I mock him in front of everybody else for what? Out of my own insecurity? Why did I do that to him? I just put a little ugliness in the world. I don't want to be that person. He says, stop and think about, did I offend somebody else? And make it personal. So many of us are like, yeah, the world's full of hate. The world's terrible. Yeah, you can't control what the world does. You can't control what they, the other party does. You can't control what those people do, but you can control you. And as far as it depends on you, become a responsible moral agent of saying, where have I put hate out in the culture? Where have I put anger out in the culture? And let me own it. And let me be honest. That's where it gets hard, but that's where it gets healing. Some of you have never had that experience of walking in with all the armor off and saying to somebody else, hey, when I said this, it was rude and I'm sorry and leave it. Now, yes, but you said this, and you did this, and you always did that, and you always did it. Yeah, yeah, they did things too. But you're responsible for you. And how Paul said it, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with all men. Think about your own life. Is there anyone you need to apologize to? And not tell them all the wrong they've done, but just admit the wrong you've done. Often when you do that, it creates a safe space for people to share theirs back. So make it personal. Make it theological. That's what Jesus does. Some of us go, Ben, I can't forgive that person. There's no way. I can't go and ask for forgiveness from that person. But Jesus links it to our spiritual life. That's why he uses that altar imagery and uses judgment imagery. He uses the altar and the throne. He says, when you're thinking about the fact that you might have hurt someone and need to apologize, connect it to your relationship with me. So it's the resistance in you may go, well, they don't deserve it. Of course they don't. Well, they might reject it. They might. Well, I don't think they would value how brave I'm being by doing this. They may not. But I'm asking you, as a recipient of my grace, to be a conduit of grace. Are you going to stop the stream? Or are you going to let it flow through you? And so I'm asking you to go. And how they respond, that's up to them. But you be a conduit of grace in the world. So he says, make it theological. As a function of worshiping me, apologize to them. And he makes it theological by taking it to final judgment. And that's why by making it theological, it sobers us and it comforts us. 
it sobers us. He says, you have to do this. You have to, as a function of relating to me. I'm telling you to do it. And you don't want to show up in my presence having blown me off. Uh, it's interesting. My kids, whenever they're fighting in their room, I've started to do this lately. If I hear them fighting over a toy, something that's not going to like end in blood. You know, some issue. I'll walk in there and I'll go, what's going on in here? And then I'll say, do you want me to get involved? And they usually say, no, 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 we got it, we got it. And then I'll stand at the door and hear them like, I'm sorry, it's just, can you ask first before you get my toy? Yes, okay, I'll ask, okay, okay. And I'll watch them negotiate a piece, right? <laughs> but they're doing it because they know if daddy gets involved, he will be impartial <laughs> and severe. <laughs> and so they realize better to deal with it now than to wait for the final judgment, right? And here God says, you're going to meet me now as gracious and kind. At the end, I'm the judge. Don't wait till then. Don't look at me and say, yeah, I know you told me to forgive these people, but I blew you off. Don't, don't wait for that. But there's a comfort in it too. Because many of us say, but if I forgive that person, or if I apologize to them before they apologize to me, I'm letting them off the hook. And who's going to punish them? And that's where being theological helps because you can read verses like, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And you go, he'll deal with them. He will judge them. And verses like this comfort you because what they let you know is every sin will be paid for. No one gets away with anything. It will be paid for either in Jesus' shed blood on the cross or in their life in hell. And if you're not wishing hell on someone, and you pray for their redemption and you obey the king who was willing to pour out his life for his enemies and you go apologize and you make things right as far as it depends on you. So you make it theological. Now, does that mean that we never take issues to court? No. If you've been physically abused, you should report somebody, but not so that they'll get destroyed. It's so that you can protect the rest of society from someone who's abusive. Do you see the different motivation? It's not resentment, it's love. And that makes all the difference for you. So you make it theological. I may need to report somebody, but it's always with a hope of redemption and a concern for the community, right? And yet when I'm dealing with somebody who's hurt me, I can trust my soul to the Lord and their soul to the Lord. So you make it personal and you make it theological. As a function of knowing God, I'm going to do this. And you make it eternal. He brings up the end here because he says, hey, we're all hurtling towards the same place. But let's hope when they get there, it'll be a place of grace and kindness. I'll tell you for me, just honestly, as we close, I had a lot of resentment in my heart after my parents' divorce, a lot of anger. And anger can be a comfort. It can be a motivator, it can make you feel good. It can make you feel justified that there's, a, there's an intoxicating element to being furious. It's why we're so drunk on it in America now. But you don't get to contain the receptacle of anger. It spills out in the rest of your heart and messes up all your relationships. And I realized in my 20s, I don't wanna hate anymore. It's too toxic of a substance for me to carry. And so I remember going and following these steps in the Sermon on the Mount, coming to the Lord and saying, I don't wanna be angry anymore, but I'm powerless to stop it. And His grace flooded in. His kindness overwhelmed me. A picture of the cross, knowing Jesus, saved my soul. And then the most fascinating thing happened. For the first time in my life, I considered how I had been cruel to my father. I had always felt entitled. Well, he started it. He did it first. I had never stopped to consider, yes, all that, but you've judged him and condemned him. You've created no path of redemption in your heart, even as you pray for him. And you've been rude. As a Christian, you've been mean. And religious bad people are the worst. When you want to make a really evil bad guy in a movie, make him a religious bad guy. <laughs> and I was like, I don't want to be that. Whatever my father becomes, I don't want to be that. And so I had to release my anger, trust God. And then I had to apologize for the wrong I've done. And then not right on the heels of that, but over time, the most amazing thing happened. I watched God capture my father's heart that anything is possible. Nobody's too far gone. God can do amazing, miraculous things. And we don't get to control how it flows, but he's given us responsibility for us. And so we say, for my part, I'm gonna receive grace. And then for my part, 
I'm gonna show grace. For my part, I'm not gonna hide before God. I'm gonna come honest and real and trust that as I come poor and empty and confessing, his mercy floods in. And then by his strength alone and his power alone, I'll extend that mercy to others. That's how we live. And you watch when a flood of mercy begins to flow out of a community like this, when people hear us apologize for each other, we don't let the sediment of resentment build up. They'll go, what kind of people are you? No one does this. If someone offends you, you store it to use against them later. You guys let it go. It's weird and different and beautiful. It's a light in the darkness. It's a city on a hill. That's what we're meant to be.